This is the Monday, March 6, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine travels back to the earliest days of the American Republic, the Second War of American Independence, the War of 1812. For the first time in this rematch against Great Britain, Congress used the Constitution's power to declare war, and for the last time, the men doing the fighting supplied their own weapons. Our guest as we muster into the service is James N. Gibson, and his book is A War Without Rifles, The 1792 Militia Act and the War of 1812. Mr. Gibson is proof that there's no one path to publication in the field of history. He was born into the U.S. space program through his father and is himself an aerospace engineer. His resume features the names of such giants in the field as Boeing and McDonnell Douglas as well as work on the International Space Station and Space Shuttle programs. His previous books include Nuclear Weapons of the United States, an Illustrated History, and The Navajo Missile Project, the story of the know-how missile of American rocketry. You can learn more about these and his other works at jngibson.com or follow him on Twitter at J.N. Gibson 55. And if you enjoy this period of history, check out my interview with John McCavitt and Christopher T. George, authors of The Man Who Captured Washington, Major General Robert Ross, and The War of 1812. You can find that in our archives wherever you're listening now, or stream it at historyauthor.com. Okay, now that we've grabbed our musket and left our farms to answer President Madison's call to defend the nation, let's join James N. Gibson and enlist for A War Without Rifles. I'm joined on the line by James N. Gibson, author of A War Without Rifles, the 1792 Militia Act and the War of 1812. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Thank you. You make a very frank statement to kick off a war without rifles. You say you had no idea what you'd find when you started researching the Militia Act of 1792, since most of our listeners are probably in the same boat there as far as the war goes, much less this act of Congress. Take us back to the beginning. Tell us what the goals of this act were and how you got interested in studying this aspect of this forgotten war. Well, what drew me to the research was just originally discovering that the 1792 Militia Act had basically become not just forgotten, but literally declared to have never been enforced, which didn't make any sense for an act that stayed on the federal books for 100 years. The goal of the act was to create a national militia system that was uniform from one section of the country to the other. Thus, they would have specific procedures for disciplining men, training the men, requirements for how often the men would come together in militia musters, and of course, above all, the requirements for their firearm, which they had to acquire themselves. And the Militia Act had a caliber clause in it, which was rather different. So um, I started doing some investigation into the congressional record, trying basically to see what I could find in the realm of any additional documentation, debate, discussion. 
one of the things I was also looking into was to see how many times I could find references to caliber of shot, caliber of a gun at that time being described as a weight of shot. That's like what people see with the 22 or a 38 or whatever the caliber is. This They actually did it by weight because they were all lead balls. Which is understandable because in the time of the 1792 Militia Act, everything was a lead ball. And now everything today is a conical shape. So we go with the diameter of the bullet. Yeah. They did everything, as I said, weight of shot or just about the weight of anything for that matter. And when you say rifles, I always get a little bit taken out of the moment and confused when I hear the term rifle because these would have been smooth bores that were in these muskets that they were using? Correct. In those days, everything was based on weight of shot, whereas today we would actually measure the bore of the gun. And of course, that being said, the guns of that period, many times they're identified today as a 75 caliber, 67 caliber as in the case of the Charlottesville muskets. The fact of the matter is they're closer akin to a shotgun than to a modern rifle. They didn't have any kind of rifling, and the bullets did not have, have any spin imparted on them when they left the, the bore of the gun, that left the muzzle of the gun. So, and in fact, um, American military policy at that time, thanks to Washington, he was very fond of this, they used a buck and ball in which they would put in one large bullet and two to three smaller bullets when they did a, a load. So you had more than one chance of actually hitting something. Yeah, or someone. No fun. Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do if you go out somewhere like Gettysburg and see some of those old musket balls or some of the old rounds or the grape shot is the most terrifying of all. I, I think probably every time I eat grapes, I think of getting hit with some lead balls that were that size that they, in that case, would fire out of a cannon. I mean, those things would just do so much damage if they hit you. I mean, it's no fun to get hit with a bullet, but at least it's pointed at the end and you have a chance of a easier through and through, I think maybe with like a little 22 or something like that. I mean, I don't want to get shot at all and find out, but I I certainly wouldn't want to get shot with one of those balls that is just going to do so much damage. And, oh gosh, that, that's a tough thing. And I, I said to you before that I was happy that you wrote a war without rifles because it's not right to say you like a war, but I read about all the sacrifice in the War of 1812. And I think it's not fair that we've forgotten it. It's sort of become almost a punchline if we do talk about it. It was really serious. And these people, these men that fought it, they didn't take it as a joke. Certainly they were required by this act, if they were military age, to own a specific type of firearm. This was mandatory. That was considered to be the arsenal of the country. That's where their defense was going to come from, not from a standing army. Yet you wrote in the book, which I was surprised to learn, that it didn't mean cities and states couldn't regulate other weapons. And that probably seems like an oxymoron to today's Americans. You're going to insist that people have rifles, and yet you're going to maybe limit some of the other ones that they can have in their homes. So explain how governments divided this line between those required firearms and the ones, say, that were of choice you might use to go out hunting for food or for survival against attacks. Well... The states themselves had certain authorities. The federal government laid down the requirements in the 1792 Militia Act for the arm that every able-bodied male had to possess. And, of course, he had to also be registered on the militia rolls of that state. Now, beyond that, you could have communities that would implement some kind of regulation. The city of Washington, D.C. supposedly implemented a regulation against the firing of a firearm within city limits. Hmm. I had found some references to the Congress sending the city council of Washington, D.C. at least two letters telling them basically to cease and desist a certain action they were doing against their own city militia. You have to tell us what that is, by the way. You give us the background on that. What was this? I'm not quite sure myself because uh. there was a reference to the letters, but I couldn't find the letter. <laughs> so I'm not specifically sure exactly. What I believe what this had to do with, because the city council, city of Washington, D.C. during the Heller case commented that they were imposing this prohibition against the firing of guns within city limits on the militia during the militia musters. And during the militia muster, 
the men were required to show that their weapon functioned properly by actually discharging it. So if they actually discharged their weapon during the city muster, the next thing they could expect was to be either fined or at least arrested by the city constable. And if they didn't discharge their weapon when ordered to do so, now they're doing an act of insubordination against their commanding officer, hmm. which could get them an even bigger fine. <laughs> I suspect, and I'm, I, I say this I suspect because I'm still trying to get more information as to what the city fines were, that the end result was that the men of the city militia began simply leaving their guns at home when they had to come out for the militia muster, hmm. because that was the smallest fine that could be imposed on them. Hmm. Because again, there was even a fine for not showing up for the militia muster. Do you think it had anything to do, the law, with the dueling that might have happened at the time in the Capitol? Or? Oh, there was no dueling in the Capitol. What was happening was that if, if men had a duel, uh, an action of honor, they would actually ride out to the community of Bladensburg, which, of course, becomes more famous for the Battle of Bladensburg, in which the British defeated our militia forces and then marched into the city of Washington and burned the Capitol in 1814. But Bladensburg was the place people would go out to to have their duels. Hmm. And then they would come back into the city, hopefully uh, both of them still, still standing. But that's what was happening. They simply took it outside of the city limits. And this act now, this was to make sure that when these men were bringing these rifles, these men in the militia, that they were uniform so that you could... I guess, have the same shot? Is that the idea, that they wanted to make them uniform? Is that why they passed this? They want everybody to be armed, and they want to be able to load the same shot in from, say, if you come from Maryland or if you come from Massachusetts? Oh, it, it goes even beyond that, because the weight of shot that was actually called out is the same weight of shot that was actually used by the muskets of the Federal Army at that time. So not only would they have uniformity across state lines between the states, if they were working with a federal army unit, they could exchange ammunition. They could use ammunition cartridges that had been pre-set up and supplied by a federal armory or the state armory's ammunition or the ammunition in the men's own packs of the militia could then be also passed to assist the federal units if whoever was running low. It seems like it was a good idea at the time for efficiency. And even though the war doesn't go too well on the land, when you're trying to use these militia guys who may be trained one day, quote unquote, that they were spending at a bar or what have you, they didn't necessarily all have the same rigorous standards. But as far as supplies, just like the railroads, it reminds me of in the civil war, having the same gauge seems like it was a pretty good idea. So you wouldn't have to take your you know, your supplies off or what have you and switch them to another train because you got to a state line. It seems like that uniformity, at least, was a good idea to prepare for this fight. It was a really intelligent action on their part. But at the same time, it created its own chaos because, again, they're telling everyone that they have to carry a certain type of musket, which was a smoothbore musket at that time. And when you start looking at the communities coming into existence beyond the Appalachia Mountains that are moving westward, those men tended to carry a rifle, a, a true rifle. And the caliber of rifles at that time did not exceed 0.55, so they were way too small to meet the, quote, requirements of the 1792 Militia Act. They were using them for different stuff, right? I mean, they were using them actually for shooting, I guess, and wanted them for accuracy. And I guess a little projectile or a smaller projectile would go farther and that would help them for something like chasing down game. I don't quite know what the real reason was why the Pennsylvania gunsmiths who basically invented the rifle, though it actually was an import from Germany, why their caliber was 0.55 and, and going smaller. But the, the general characteristic was that it was a smaller shot. It was definitely good enough to take down the majority of the game at that time. They could carry more of it, more formed bullets for the same weight, which was good when you're on a long hunt way out in the early, early West. But getting back to the subject of a military arm, since the original military rifles used by the federal government 
the guns acquired for the contract rifles of 1792 or the guns manufactured at Harper's Ferry being .55 themselves. What was a civilian hunting rifle was, in fact, the initial pattern for the initial federal military rifles. How few and far between they actually were, though. I want you to take us back and put us in the shoes of these men who are training to be in the militia or who are required to at least have the gun to be able to come to the national defense. When I interviewed John McCavitt and Christopher T. George, co-authors of The Man Who Captured Washington, also about the War of 1812, we dwelled on this a little bit about these militiamen, what that life was like. And then when I read A War Without Rifles, I wondered – how much does this cost to buy this rifle that maybe is not functional for them? Or how, how much of a burden is it? If you're just a farmer, you might be able to use that money to put into something you need and want. And also, you might just not want the thing laying around. You have to take care of it. You don't just buy a gun and let it lay there. So I was wondering, what does that cost? Put us in their shoes of, of these militiamen. When he looks down at his weapon, when he looks down at his uniform, what does he see? It would be based on where the militiaman is. And as you point out, you were interviewing gentlemen who had worked up the history regarding the actual battles in the Chesapeake Bay area in Maryland. And Maryland was, unfortunately, next to Delaware, it was probably one of the worst states for enforcing its militia code, hmm. primarily because when you look at Maryland, they hadn't had an Indian attack since the French and Indian Wars. There was very few of any real incidences in Maryland during the revolution. You might count the Battle of Brandywine, but that was right at the border of Maryland and Pennsylvania. And uh, the British forces were not heading westward. They were actually heading eastward to take uh, Philadelphia by the back door. So most of the men in Maryland during the time of the War of 1812, they hadn't seen any kind of incident in well over 30 years. Hmm. So they're looking down at this gun that they were required to buy. I can actually say that it probably was a discount gun that was uh, sold off by the French in 1803 during the lull in the Napoleonic Wars. Basically, he's looking down at this thing and kind of asking himself, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> I thought you were going to, I thought you were setting up that uh, old French joke, French rifle for sale, only never used, only dropped once. No, 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 no. And, and they, and they, <laughs> again, these, these are muskets. These are not rifles. The French actually never fielded a rifle unit during the Napoleonic period. But we did have a wonderful period during the short term peace of 1803 when uh, they were selling the guns at basically bare bottom prices at American ports and American locations. If you were required to buy one and you didn't really want to have to, why not just, I guess, pick up the cheapest one you could find and leave it in a corner? That's basically what it, what it came down to on many areas of the country. Now, the flip side of this is the guys who are living west of the Appalachians, who are also probably hunting as part of their livelihood. In fact, hunting might even be their livelihood. They have more likely a rifle. They have been told they have to buy a musket, which they had very little interest in. The letters in William Claiborne's letter books talk about when he received the shipment of old muskets to sell to the militiamen of Mississippi. And he basically points out that the men have absolutely no interest in buying those old muskets. The flip side was a shipment of about 500 brand new rifles from Pennsylvania that also had been delivered. And the men were basically uh, literally almost falling over themselves trying to get approved to purchase the gun. Hmm. And when you were talking about how the men purchased it, under the Act of 1798, the federal government took responsibility to ensure that guns shipped from Pennsylvania or from Massachusetts to areas like Mississippi uh, arrived in good condition, and the federal government would receive payment for the weapons in whatever raw material or product that area produced. Hmm. The men of Mississippi paid for their rifles in bales of cotton hmm. at market price. 
And the federal government then delivered those bales of cotton to the textile industries that had been developing after the revolution in Connecticut, Massachusetts. In some ways, the federal government was actually making money. <laughs> also, probably one of the reasons they wanted to make sure these things would fire when you talked about them you know, getting the rock bottom prices one, you might just get one and not even care that it fired if you just had to show up with something, sort of like you do one of those T-shirt exchanges, you know, and they say, bring any T-shirt you want, we'll give you a new one. You know, people bring any old junky things. So I mean, it really was life and death is strange and maybe foreign concept as it seems. It was important that they wanted these to actually be able to work. And this was kind of an experiment with Republic, not wanting to have a standing army and seeing what the citizenry could do with it. And I guess that was the goal here, a goal here of an act to arm it, tell everybody to be armed. I also wanted to go back and ask you again how you got the idea for the book, because I don't think we touched on that. This seems like so far afield from your career in aerospace. So what made you decide to write A War Without Rifles? Well, the point of it was is that as I'm looking through the congressional record and I'm looking at the various references, as I said, to the 1792 Militia Act or its caliber clause, I'm finding so much other material, so many things that talk of the period that I just felt I needed to do something to document what I was finding. And the best way to actually do it was to put together a book talking about the actions taken by the government to create the national militia system and then how it responded, how it worked during the one major war where it was actually implemented in. And that was the War of 1812. One of the names people might know is William Henry Harrison. I wanted to touch on him. He's a forgotten president because he serves only 30 days. He's kind of one of those men in the 19th century that serves as president, but is remembered only as a trivia question. This was an important part of his life, though. This is sort of what makes him. You write in A War Without Rifles, quote, Harrison was no fool when it came to fighting in the great Northwest. Regardless of the 1792 Militia Act's prohibition against rifles, he had a large force of riflemen drawn from Kentucky, unquote. Who were those men? We mentioned that these would have been different from the men that were in the East. These men would have had rifles. Who were those men, and how does Harrison make use of them? Earlier, I made mention of the fact that the men who were west of the Appalachians, they would be basically hunters. They, would be, they might be farmers as well, but these men lived in the country. They owned guns. They needed guns, and particularly rifles, to defend either their property or bring game home to feed their families. So when you look at the militia returns for Kentucky and Tennessee, you would see these references to very few, if any, official riflemen in the militia returns. And then you look at the ordinance report, and you would find you know, four or five, maybe even upwards of six times as many rifles as the smoothbore muskets that are hmm. required by the Militia Act. So basically, the, what the states were actually doing was they were simply ignoring the fact that the majority of their men didn't own the proper gun and owned rifles instead, and they would simply list it. So in the case of William Henry Harrison or even Andrew Jackson, who was fighting the Creek Indians in the South, both of them were drawing the majority of their troops from states that actually contained, I think, what was the number I came up with? I came up with something, I think, like a third of all the rifles within the country was simply within the two states of Tennessee and Kentucky. Hmm. This is a quote from the governor of Tennessee, Willie Blount, to volunteers leaving to join General Jackson, December 2nd, 1812. The volunteers will arm and equip themselves with rifles so far as practical. Those having no rifles of their own, or if those they have be not immediately serviceable, will be furnished by the state to the extent of the supply on hand. But it is hoped that this reserve, scanty at best, will not be drawn upon to exhaustion. Ammunition furnished by the state, each volunteer, including company officers, is entitled to a powder horn full of the best eagle powder, one dozen new sharp flints, and lead enough to mold 100 bullets that fit his rifle. Key point being his rifle. Very small rifles are not desirable for military service. It is recommended that none be taken along of less caliber than 60 balls to the pound. It is desired to avoid smoothbore muskets as much as possible. They are heavy, clumsy, take a great deal of shot, and do not carry straight. 
They may be good enough for the regular soldiers, but not the citizen volunteers of Tennessee. And, of course, the only reason he can make such a speech like that was simply the number of rifles within the state in the first place. <laughs> so when they were calling for men, when they were calling for volunteers, basically the majority of the men that would actually come forward would probably be owning a rifle and also know exactly how to use it. So those were useful to him. You wouldn't turn those guys away. I would guess I'd rather have them in there than the smooth bars we talked about. Well, you made the comment earlier – what would the man think when he looked down at his gun? And I mentioned the Maryland soldier wondering what the hell he's doing there. Mm -hmm. The men of Kentucky, the men of Tennessee, these men had been fighting Indians as recently as five years earlier. The men of Kentucky, in fact, one year before the War of 1812 started, marched into Prophetstown and tried to finish off Tecumseh. That's a town, I guess, named after his brother. That was his brother, the prophet, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. So they were ready for a fight. They were ready to take on British troops. They were ready to take on the British troops because they viewed them as the allies of the Indians. That, and they also were ready to fight. When you look at the battle reports, if you had a confrontation with militia on the East Coast and British troops, whether it be a raiding party during the War of 1812 or maybe one of the more major set-piece battles, many times the militia you know, basically couldn't hold the ground and were more of a detriment than a mm -hmm. blessing. The flip side were the troops that Harrison or Andrew Jackson tended to gather up. Probably the best example, if not one of the most egregious examples, was the Battle of the River Raisin, where they had both Kentucky militia and regular federal troops. The federal troops were the ones that were driven off first. And the commanding general of the American force had to actually order the Kentucky militia to surrender because they just wouldn't give up fighting. And that's one reason William Henry Harrison gets his nickname there, Tippecanoe, because he wins that battle. And I, now that I'm getting the background here and the actual equipment that the men are using, the actual firearms, seems to make a little sense here that he and Andrew Jackson were both able to really cause some hurt on their opponents because they were armed with weapons that would make a difference, it seems. They were definitely, definitely armed quite differently than what you would find on the East Coast. And you wanted to mention something about Andrew Jackson, how he dealt with rules or laws that stood in his way. Yes, <laughs> basically ignored them. <laughs> yeah. I have an ancestor who served with Jackson in New Orleans. Wow. But officially, he wasn't supposed to be there because Jackson only had the authority to call upon troops from Tennessee. My ancestor was from Kentucky. Didn't bother Jackson. He called them anyways. When he wanted supplies brought from Pittsburgh Landing, he contracted a steamboat to you know, bring it all the way down from the Ohio River to New Orleans. But that violated the uh, monopoly, the Fulton Livingston monopoly on steamboats in the lower Mississippi. And again, he just simply ignored it. He just went right on past it. That was his character. If it was in his way, he just went right on through it. There's always something attractive about those figures. People like them, unless you're the one, I guess, that they're rolling over. <laughs> True enough. The heirs of the Fulton uh, Livingston monopoly were not thrilled, particularly when it eventually uh, caused the monopoly to be broken in the courts. Mm -hmm. There was also a comment I wanted to make. You were asking about the cost to the men of buying the weapon. And I remember this. This was a passage I found in the congressional record in 1810. The militia are generally composed of poor men whose burdens are already more than they ought to be, and but few of that class get exempt from military duty by offices. And I believe that they do not own the one one hundredth part of the property in the United States. Why then should they do all this duty to defend it? It now costs the poor man about fifteen dollars to equip himself, and if he has sons, it costs him as much more for them besides all their time at training, which is a poor man's estate. And we mentioned military age, or you do, when you talk about the 7092 Militia Act. What would that have been considered? What's the youngest you'd have to be when they'd start requiring you to own this gun? 18. Okay. So sort of similar to the draft. It's actually in line with our federal draft, but when you think about it, 
45, which was the max age in those days, that, you were pretty old, actually, at yeah. that time, at 45. My guest is author James N. Gibson, and his book is A War Without Rifles, the 1792 Militia Act and the War of 1812. You can visit our guest at jngibson.com or follow him on Twitter at jngibson55. A War Without Rifles is described as, quote, a very different look at this war and the militia system that operated at the time, unquote. That description notes that your book includes 95 maps and illustrations. I'm looking at the cover here right now, for instance, and really a moving shot, action shot. Well, not a shot, I shouldn't say, but, you know, a a painting of the war, skirmish in the war. It's really visual. And I wondered if as an engineer, you had a special eye towards the visual component of telling this story. Well, I obviously uh, was looking over all the drawings, all the maps that were available, and uh, trying to select some of the best images to depict various events. There's a very large variety that have been produced over the last 200 years. Some of them are very good representations of the period. Others are a bit more, how should one say, politically motivated. (laughs) <laughs> dramatized a little bit of a mm-hmm. spin for us the soldier's wife at fort niagara I opened up to here you have some drawings of the forts wilkinson's march i mean really a lot of pictures that you might not expect from a book you know you figure you're going to pick it up it's a long time ago but you forget how important the illustrations are to telling the story the topography all those kind of things I, I was pleasantly surprised by that and you need to have such things because you're trying to particularly on the maps you're trying to describe Uh, The movement of troops over, in some cases, rather large areas. Uh, You mentioned Wilkinson's march to Montreal. I had to, in fact, work that one out. There is virtually no good drawing of the of the general describing the general march in the attempt to take Montreal in 1813. (laughs) You also reproduced the famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. And that's someone that I think we've all seen at least a hundred times in our lives somewhere. I mean, it's in car commercials, you know, it's all kinds of places. We'll see it. I never read or heard about the impact of the little ice age on our understanding of that historic moment. You realize, or I realized when I read it in your book that, yeah, that's true. There's a whole ton of ice there in the Delaware and you don't think of the Delaware freezing over by Trenton where he's going and how much ice there would have been and how little ice other times. So sure. Share that observation with us. I thought that was a fun thing, not necessarily contemporary to now, but it was a good thing to know. I'll never look at that picture again the same way. Well, the reason I brought it up is because there have been a number of comments from people decades after the painting was put together that it was too stylized with too much ice in it by the artist. The people commenting, of course, had ne- had actually been born after the official end of the Little Ice Age. So again, they would look at the river in their time frame, which would be around maybe the Civil War, and it never got that ch- choked with ice. But the artist was actually old enough to remember it, remember the period, and knew how hmm. tough the winters actually could get at that time. And the winters at that time could be extreme. Another example of this, you see people today who make the comment that Lake Ontario today does not freeze over. The implication is that it never does. Well, I can't say for sure whether it actually did or didn't during the time of the mini ice age, but the ice would become so severe that all military operations during the War of 1812 on Lake Ontario had to shut down during the winter. Mm. And we had intended launching an attack against the main British port on Lake Ontario, but we couldn't do it because we couldn't get close enough to the shore because of the the ice offshore. So instead, the attack was redirected against York with its own implications. Right. The commanding officer was killed right in the initial assault phase. We basically lost control of a lot of the troops after that, and uh, there was... <laughs> a lot of unfortunate burning of public buildings. And so that is usually marked down as what prompted the eventual retaliatory attack in 1814 
against Washington and the burning of our Capitol and our congressional buildings. And they take the mace, I think, of the Speaker of Parliament there, and they haul that back to the U.S. And we don't give that back to the Canadians until FDR. So that's a long time, that's, 125 that's years or something. So I think there are still some uh, battle incidents that we still have at various locations, whether they're West Point or Annapolis, taken during the War of 1812 and uh, have not quote, return them to the British or the Canadians. Yeah, we we hold on to a lot of stuff. I guess we're a little bit like those men in Maryland were, at least I am. You're isolated from the fighting, but these were very real things. People were fighting and dying for them, and they got a hold of that flag or that mace after being in the thick of it. You know, they, they weren't they weren't about to give it up. That takes some generations to decide you're going to uh, try to be the bigger person and be friendly again. That's a certain amount of truism, but at the same time, the comment is has been that uh, we started as enemies and. We've been allies since uh, basically World War One, so it took some while, but um, we're staunch allies now. Two countries separated by a common language, as Churchill said. And there's a bunch of flags to celebrate the centennial, nations that celebrated our centennial in the U.S. in 1876. And I looked at it now, and because of what you just said about what close allies we are with the former mother country, I was surprised the Union Jack wasn't there. And then I said, oh, right, that would make sense. You know, the tensions were still raw. Feelings were still raw between the U.S. and Great Britain. It seemed, still seemed like we might have to fight a third war with the empire, which fortunately never came to being. That that around the turn of the last century was pretty much the last time. But this was a real war. People died and it left hard feelings. Well, the War of 1812 it wasn't just that people died. <laughs> the Indians used by the British, let's just say that their policy when it came to captives was not the same as that that we would use on any captive British troops. So there was a lot of anger that had been building up before the war and really set forth uh, later on during the um, latter half of the conflict. James Monroe also appears in A War Without Rifles. I always like to mention James Monroe when I'm talking about the War of 1812. He really rises to the occasion there. He's in the Revolutionary War. He's actually at the Battle of Trenton there after Washington manages to cross the river in that epic painting. And he gets wounded there. He's shot, I believe, in the upper chest. He's fortunate to survive. And that's how he becomes a legend. That's how he becomes president. He appears there as Madison's Secretary of State, and he picks up the mantle of Secretary of War because the Secretary of War, Armstrong, just falls apart, basically. And I wanted to know, what's the reaction to him plugging this hole and setting us on the route for the next 150 or so years when we'd raise armies periodically through the draft every now and then or have a standing army? What is the role that this war, what's the impact that this war has on our future policy as a country? Well, Monroe ends up writing the letter to Congress describing what could be viewed as the first U.S. military draft or making the proposals for the first U.S. military draft. And um, <laughs> you have to understand, I don't have as, as a nice regard for Monroe. I think he saw the war as a way of elevating himself further politically. He had had quite a political career up to then, including being the governor of Virginia for several years before the War of 1812. But um, I hate to say this, he wanted the war. <laughs> he wanted the war. Armstrong, who he replaced, wanted the war. As I said, probably the only person who didn't want the war was actually Madison. Yeah. <laughs> And he gets it called Mr. Madison's War, gets all his books burned for his trouble. You know, <laughs> There's a story that um, when Washington was actually captured and Dolly Madison had to flee the White House with the portrait of Washington, she came upon a inn and tried to get shelter for the night. And the wife of the innkeeper, who was in charge because the innkeeper was out with the militia, basically sent her packing because, quote, her husband was now out fighting because of Dolly's husband. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they Madison never was able to throw that it was his war, though in the long run, he didn't really ever really want it. 
Well, there was plenty that wanted it at the time. This is where we get the Warhawk Congress term from. But if you want to look at Monroe as relatively a dove, Theodore Roosevelt, who writes his book on the Naval War of 1812, he writes in that, I remember reading it and being shocked that he says going to war against Britain was one thing, but also France was offending the national honor. And really, the United States should have declared war on both England and France. And I'm looking at the book and saying, he, <laughs> it seems like an awful, crazy thing to take on both of the world's major powers there. But that was what TR was saying the national honor would have required. So I always think that's a little bit funny. So at least Monroe, I guess, only wanted a war with with Britain to kind of pad his resume and his abilities because he wasn't going to get anywhere on his writings, certainly, or his intellect. He was just a guy that looked really good in a military uniform. So maybe that was part of his thinking, any chance to put one on again. And what I'll also state on the subject of why we didn't have to declare war against France, other than the fact we'd already had a conflict with France in the form of a quasi-war during the Adams administration. The thing to keep in mind is, technically, the concept of invading Canada and declaring war against England was simply because England was tied up fighting France. So we expected that it would be a very quick confrontation. We would then be able to dictate terms to England within just a few months of invading Canada. Instead, it ended up as a prolonged battle, prolonged war. And we were no way set up for a prolonged confrontation. The Treasury couldn't support it. We eventually nearly almost ran out of muskets for the army. Of course, after Napoleon was defeated in 1814, we start seeing this huge number of British troops being redeployed from Europe to Canada. And then we started seeing, instead of the Canadians being on the defensive to our military operations into Canada, we've started seeing the British coming into the United States. We saw the attacks against Washington and Baltimore, the massive military force that was sent down Lake Champlain to Plattsburgh, and of course the, the major military force that was sent against New Orleans. And Andrew Jackson, as Paul Cahan said when I interviewed him about his book, The Bank War, if you have a chance to put Andrew Jackson in your book, I say do it. He's a colorful character. So you did that in there. Old Hickory does appear in your book. And we talked about how he just arms his men with rifles. He kind of ignores the Militia Act, which surprises nobody who knows how Jackson went. And he wins that Battle of New Orleans after the war is over, unbeknownst to him. Another thing is will be shocking to us today, I guess, with instant communication and things like Skype. But we do have some legacies of this war with us today that I, I wanted to mention. In 1916, the nation establishes the Office of Civilian Marksmanship. I participated in that sort of program with the Boy Scouts. We would shoot 22s, nice and small, no musket balls. And more recently, the government-sponsored M1 Garand shoots. The M1 Garand is the rifle that General George S. Patton said won the war for us. So this is kind of that same legacy of the militia, wanting to keep proficient in using rifles, have people comfortable or around weapons. There's a, a bunch of ideas behind doing this. You can actually purchase one of those Garands if you want after that program, if you complete it. So what is the legacy of this Militia Act of 1792 today in our world in 2017? Does it still have a place in our lives? Well, primary place it still has is in the Selective Service Act in which you have the same age requirements, the duty of the male population to serve, the same concept for the exemption list. The 1792 Militia Act had an exemption list for certain key occupations. The same thing goes for the modern uh, Selective Service Act. Certain people, certain occupations are deemed as too important to their community to cause them to be conscripted away. You also have things called the state defense force system, which would be things like the California State Military Reserve or the Texas State Guard or the New York State Guard. And these are secondary militias under the National Guard, forces that can be raised by their individual states in a time of war. Universally, though, these are just a bit more than a pure militia of that time frame, because they usually 
operate with retired military personnel and under the regulations of the National Guard Bureau. And of course, you mentioned the CMP program. Again, its purpose is to maintain a pool of trained marksmen for military service. Again, that means the draft. So there are a number of different aspects of what could be called a militia system or militia legacies that still exist today. I have a final question for you. You lament in a war without rifles that the War of 1812 is so little studied and little remembered. What do you think it has to teach us 200 years later in an era where we do have a standing professional army, citizens, farmers don't expect to get a call from the commander in chief telling them, hey, pick up that rifle we made you buy, the individual mandate for a musket there, uh, to use a modern term. What do you think it has to teach us this War of 1812? Well, first thing, keep in mind that the War of 1812, the nation was actually split. We were not uniform in fighting the conflict until it began to look like the British were going to win. And then we started banding together. People didn't appreciate what fighting really was. And as I said, you would have people in Maryland, in Delaware, on the East Coast. They might be war hawks because of the British attacks on the shipping, their shipping and their commerce and their businesses. But then all of a sudden to find themselves actually having to pick up a gun and actually fight British troops was a completely different thing. <laughs> yeah. Many of them were not ready for it. My comment in this matter actually is that when the militia system was finally disbanded in 1840 and we fell onto the volunteers, which you see at the first battle of Bull Run during the Civil War. They were all very highly trained. They were all very disciplined. They all had wonderful looking uniforms. They looked great. And they were all parade ground troops. The people, though, of the community, particularly of, say, Washington, D.C., when the troops were marching to Richmond towards that Battle of Bull Run, the people of Washington, they packed picnic baskets, got into carriages rode out to watch what to them was expected to be nothing more than an oversized version of a militia muster. Hmm. They had no appreciation of what was going to happen. And in the end, when the Union troops were routed, you had Union troops trying to clear the battlefield with civilians in those same carriages fleeing back to Washington, back across the Potomac. It was a nightmare. Rude awakening. Very rude awakening. And my concern for today, after all these years of having a very highly professional army, and I'm not saying they can't fight, they can fight very, very well. But when I sit there and I look at a sealed unit, a SEAL team, they're very competent, very skilled. They go in, they make their attack, they get out. The only problem is if the other guy is willing to risk his troops to pin them down and you know, tie them down, they will die. And those troops have years of experience. You cannot replace them easily. Did you ever look at the British Expeditionary Force for World War I? Mm. Very highly trained, very professional, but very small. Kaiser Wilhelm basically issued a death warrant on them when they appeared on the battlefield at the start of World War I. He tried to annihilate the whole lot because he understood that, at least in his mind, he did not believe Britain could actually bring itself to implement a draft. So once those troops were gone, it was over for Britain. That's one of my concerns, is that in this modern age, we can't even bring ourselves to implement a draft like we did during World War I or World War II. And it's unfortunately my thought and it's my concern. Well, James N. Gibson, author of A War Without Rifles, I appreciate you joining me today to discuss one of my favorite forgotten topics, the War of 1812 and the men who fought in it and how they were armed. I wish you much luck with the book, and I hope listeners will check it out to inform the debates we have today and how we go about protecting our country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So thank you again for joining me. This is a good topic, and I always like to sink my teeth into it. Glad to speak with you. Again, the book is A War Without Rifles, 
1792 Militia Act, and the War of 1812. You can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark our URL for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make, and it doesn't cost anything in your shopping cart. Once again, thanks to James N. Gibson for joining us and for digging into the often neglected period of the War of 1812 and finding a way to share the lessons it has for us 200 years later. Visit him at jngibson.com or on Twitter at jngibson55. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.